Thank you for joining us with another episode of Ask a Historian. I'm Matthew Wilkinson, historian with Heritage of Mississauga. And each week we invite you to send in your questions and we'll explore the stories of the city of Mississauga together. Like, subscribe, and follow us and stay up to date on all the heritage happenings with Heritage Mississauga. Joining us this week for Ask a Historian is Michael Spaziani, an architect, a friend, uh, a, 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 a heritage champion here in the city of Mississauga. Um, and uh, a couple of weeks ago on our uh, placemaking webinar series, Michael hosted the first of the series uh, on the subject of creating the there there in Mississauga. And uh, as a result of that, uh, that uh, webinar, um, and there's a link here to see the webinar itself, but uh, as a result of that webinar, we had a number of questions we couldn't get to in the question and answer period. And so we thought we'd have a follow up here with Michael to uh, to explore kind of those those topics of uh, there there. Uh, Michael, thank you for spending some time with us and joining us here. My pleasure. Good to be back. Um, so just uh, that that topic of uh, of, of uh, the quote that you used, there, there. I'm wondering if you can just give us kind of a, a brief introduction for those that didn't watch the webinar of what you mean by, uh, by there, there. Well, it, I, I stole this quote from Gertrude Stein, who's an author that you, you may be familiar with. But um, she, she made the comment when she returned to Oakland, California in around 1940. She went back there after living in Paris for almost 40 years. And, and that span of 40 years was interesting to me because Mississauga is a city that has a, a, a lifespan of about 45 years right now. So it, it was that idea of going back to a place you remembered as a child or as a younger person, and then realizing that in the 40 years, um, things either hadn't got better or or something was missing from, from what she had experienced. So. You can imagine her coming, living in Paris, and you know, if you've been to Paris, you know that there's this wonderful sense of of the streetscapes and the cafe life and all of that, and the consistent kind of avenue characteristic, the Champs Elysees. These are all memorable places when you go, especially when you go from North America. So um, she came back to Oakland and she had a look around and she said, "Well, all the things I remember and I cherished are gone." And that coincided with the rise of the automobile use as well. So remember, the automobile grew from 1900 to 1940 in just an incredibly rapid way. It took over our lives, took over the streets. They were no longer streets for walking. This was a, a mania about how to get around the city, and the car was this exciting new technology. So that's that's what that's where she said there's there's no there there anymore there being the memorable components of her childhood, uh, of her youth. And, um, and, and it seems to me, it strikes me as a really good motto for city development. How do you preserve or how do you create a memorable condition? Sometimes I call it the soul of a city that makes it distinctive, uh, makes it unique in a sense, um, and memorable. So that's the there there that we're looking for. How do we find the, the mojo, some people call it the mojo, the thing that's unique, that's uh, particular to Mississauga. Right. Um, you know, so, and, and some of the, you know, if you ask people today, what are the memories of Mississauga? And, and many people say, well, it's a dormitory community, it's a suburban sprawl sort of thing. It's, it's not the most positive memory that's there, but, uh, I like to think that we're evolving nicely along a path of a new city. We're creating a new city yeah. from what was a, a different set of parameters back when it was formed. That was informed by the car and the street and all of that. And f so from a, that idea of there, there, then you're, you're also, um, it's not only about, you know, preservation of, of key elements of what you have, but it's also the introduction of new ideas that create a census place, right? So it's that balance between new and old still. Yeah. See, and one of the challenges here is that a lot of cities um, are using the exact same models for things like shopping centers. You look at a you look at a shopping center today with all its national brands and chains. It could be anywhere in the world, maybe anywhere in North America, more specifically. But you know, that's another. That's the opposite of the there. There, you're getting this uniform kind of uh, situation where. You don't, you don't even know where you are. You could be anywhere. Yeah. Um, that's the complete opposite of what 
uh, I think we should strive for here in this society. Find the elements that are our history. Number one, history is a great part of that story because it is unique. Um, so telling those stories, that's a, that's a theme that we can look at to find the there. Um, but it's to get away from that, uh, you know, that monetize, well, not monetize, what's the word? Monotonous. Monotony. Yep. Monotony that, that, that comes from a uniform approach, national chains, same approaches to every, every kind of development building. <laughs> so that's the, uh, that's the challenge. Um, get get away from the physical branding, basically. Yeah, yeah, there's, and, and it's, the physical branding, um, you know, if it has a Mississauga theme, and that's, that is the challenge, what is the, what is the core uh, theme of Mississauga that we can, we can say, and there, there's some examples out there that, I, that I've witnessed that are unique to some cities. Um, you know, one is Berlin, I think, and I've mentioned this before, like, Berlin is a city that went through a, a whole post-war kind of evaluation and kind of re, rediscovery of who they were. And a lot of it had to do with, you know, the memory of the war and the role that the Germ Germans played during the war. So when you visit Berlin now, you see elements on things like on the sidewalk, a little black brass plaques in the sidewalk that talk about where... Um, war resistors were shot down by the Nazis. So you have this constant memory of the role of Berlin in the war going forward. So, you know, you have a delightful city today there, but you have this constant memory of what happened and, and it's very heavy. And, and it's, uh, Miss Berlin's, you know, really adopted that as a kind of theme in their, uh, in the way their city's uh, seen and experienced. So it can be as simple as that, a brass plaque on a sidewalk that talks about a point in history. You know, that was, that's one example that caught my eye as something that we could do in a very light way, very easy kind of wayfinding thing. It's, it's just a, it's not a building. It's just a, an element that you could. Uh, I said it's subtle. So you mentioned earlier about, a, you know, it, referring to the soul of a place. And that ties into our first question we had was, uh, how can Mississauga develop a better sense or soul for their there with future development? So what are, I guess, what are some of the guiding hands that <laughs> lead the way in that realm? Yeah, I think, I think some of the, the first question I ask any new developer, any new developer I said, okay, you're generally, they're seeking density maximization. That's understood. That's, that's a natural capitalist kind of direction, but what are you doing? for the community in the sense, what are you doing to make this part of a more memorable experience for the people that experience your project? Um, that's the first question I ask a developer. I said, look, you're looking for benefits for you, private benefits, monetary benefits. Yep. What are you giving to the community? It, it's, 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 a, it's a kind of an unwritten contract, but it's one that's really important. And so that's the first kind of and, and the way they were, the response I look for is like, what, is, what do you experience in the public realm? Can you, for example, something as simple as a double row of trees along a major street, that, en that enhanced public realm is a give back. It's something that the, the public would experience on a daily basis. So, you know, you see elements like that emerging today, things like murals on walls that tell about a history that's happening for credit today and elsewhere. Um, so those are elements, but it's really the question, what is it, what's in it for the community? What's in it for the city as, as a public entity, as something that we experience? Mm -hmm. And the very simple, simple responses can be a, you know, setback instead of zero meters. Like if you look at developments in Toronto, almost every development has zero setback. They build right to the, right to the, the yeah. line. But if you use that back even 10 feet, you're getting another tree. You're getting now a city tree and a private tree, and you have an, a, an opportunity to create a kind of linear part sense. And they get a more of a landscape dominant sense. So it's not all hard and, and uh, really super urban in that sense. It's urban with a soft face. So that's an important idea. Another one is connections. How do you enhance connections through your site? I mean, the site is, you know, it's, generally it can be seen as a very privatized area. And when you have a condominium, the condominium doesn't want any public to come through. They're just paranoid about, you know, rapists, murderers, whatever. Yeah. So you, uh, 
there's an idea now about how to create mid-block connections. And those are ways to, the great example of this is Yorkville. Yorkville has these very small passages that are intimate, but they connect up a lot of parts, north, south, east, west, through, through that part of the city. And they do it in a way that only they could do. Minor, minor amounts of land are given up because the land values are so extreme. But it's successful in creating a fine scale of connectivity through the neighborhood. So that's a very powerful element that I look for uh, in any development. Say, what can you do to connect up your neighborhood, to provide shortcuts for walking, shortcuts for cycling? These, these are part of your responsibility in making a great city. Is there an economic argument to be made that speaks to the the reason? Uh, speaks to, uh, um, I guess the pr the promotion of this idea of, to the developer, like like there, there's a long term return on your investment if you do these kinds of things, or is that too early in the in the process? No, it, it's fundamental because that's how that's how I argue it with them is that this becomes a mark if you create let's say an open space or publicly accessible park space. We call them POPs. They're privately owned public space, um, meaning that they look and smell like a public park, but the developer still owns it, carries the insurance on it, parks underneath it. That's an important consideration. They can't give up that ability to park the underground under it. Right. But from a public perspective, it's an open way. It's an open, it's a park. It's another park setting that is available to, to the public. So when you create an element like that, the developer all of a sudden has a marketing benefit. He's got now units facing a park or an open space. So you kind of play it up as a, as a benefit in that sense. And you make every edge of the development have some element of an amenity that, you know, can be beneficial to the sale of units throughout the building. So these are, these are ideas about making it more palatable from a market perspective. So I, I think we've, we see the opportunities, I guess, but there's also some challenges, not only in mindset, but just in, you know, existing communities to this, you know, I guess any, any kind of development, even if the development is, is presenting some sort of there, there, uh, is there an aspect of, of nimbyism uh, that uh, kind of hinders the development of there, there in, in new developments? Very much so. Um, you know, Mississauga, a lot of people moved to Mississauga because they cherished a, a single detached home uh, with a large lot, larger lot than you know, the city of Toronto, say coming out of the city or out of a dense urban setting. That's my story. I came out of Toronto, Little Italy, downtown Toronto. We had a we we thought we had a large house. Its frontage was twenty feet, <laughs> um, and you can imagine those sixty foot lots here. You can have three major homes on it by Toronto standards. But yeah, exactly. Yeah. Let's try to do that in Mineola and it, you'd be run out of town uh, very quickly. Um, and you see the challenge even with basement uh, suites now. You're seeing that, well, there's parking concerns and we don't want that in our neighborhood and you're going to have low rent people that are in our neighborhood and that's going to create crime. So you get all of this, I call it crap, because it's, it's part of what we do in a city. When you when you create smaller units, you create more affordability, um, but you can still have luxury in a very compact house form. That's something that we still haven't wrapped our heads around in Mississauga. We and it's it's a disincentive to uh, you know moving towards a more let's say more intensified city. Everyone wants to protect that that special backyard that they have. They they, they don't want to give it up. They don't want to have any shadows on it because they own the sky. So you get all of this um, resistance. And, and I, I recently went through a very unhappy experience with, uh, with NIMBYism, and that had to do with uh, the Carmelite Sisters site, where through, through, uh, through the design process, we ended up with building heights. And this is right adjacent to a very high level, almost like a Mineola neighborhood. Mm -hmm. It's uh, uh, very cherished. We know people love their lots. They didn't want to see this thing, even though there was a convent and a senior's home on the site today. It's a 12 acre site. We were, we were hoping that there would be a tolerance for a four story, a two story convent, a four story retirement home and a, and a rental retirement building of uh, up to five stories, although in parts it was two stories that it stepped up to five in one area. But to us, that was an acceptable relationship to a, a single detached neighborhood. 
didn't it didn't cast shadows it didn't uh, it provided a complete community in the sense that if you were aging in that community adjacent and you needed you could stay in your community and mm -hmm. you could still walk and live in it like it's the idea of complete complete community we thought this was a great idea followed our strategic plan um, about complete communities about accommodating our elderly and, instead of shipping them out to more remote locations but it failed on the on the uh, both on the councillor front and because the neighborhood residents went ballistic they fought tooth and nail and today that site looks like it's going to become another set of single detached lots really yeah. to me is an absolute abandonment of our strategic plan no guts on the political side no um no vision from the neighbor's neighbor's side they couldn't see they couldn't imagine how this could coexist with their single detached homes now this is one example but it happens today along lakeshore because you know lakeshore is an intensification corridor transit systems are coming there's invitation to develop some degree of density but we know that you know there's several projects now emerging along that the corridor that are challenging the fundamental underlying zoning which talks about four stories possibly now up to eight stories but my experience has been that uh, the developed community has great difficulty uh, justifying mid-rise developments in the four to eight story range because um, the processes generally take are very expensive and very long and drawn out so when they run their pro formas they say well if everything goes tickety-boo with my eight-story development i can make it work but if something gets delayed because a neighbor says we're going to take you to the omb or olt it's now called it keeps changing its name <laughs> that's a whole other story <laughs> they're making it more user-friendly right <laughs> yeah, well, I, I don't know there's it's just, there's a lot of bad baggage bad baggage that yeah. came with the word omb so they changed it to lpat and that became a, a gong show and now they changed it to olp and it's doug ford's brand of it. yeah but um anyway it's it just uh it, that's where we have ch the challenges from the development side is that you know the mid-rise format works only when everything is absolutely perfect in the approval side you have to go to a hearing you're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars and that simply means well we're going to pack on four more stories to cover the profit margins and the costs of a million or plus appeal that's right. uncertain and high risk so you can just see them all on lakeshore they're lining up now 11 stories 14 stories etc so um it's the reality and the challenge we have nimby is part of it um uh, being safe with our standards, our zoning and official plan standards, if they're artificially low, then you're not going to get a natural fit with the development industry. They're going to always push for more. Um, we've had this experience in Cook, in, uh, in um, uh, Clarkson, where yeah. you know, there are sites, and, and this, is, this goes to a whole other challenge. The sites in Mississauga now are le remnant sites left over from earlier uses um small in their formats there's not a lot of big sites so you get this tightness that's happening with sites that emerge and when you want to do something even a, a six-story building clarkson became an impossible ask uh four stories was set as the absolute maximum so developers they come along they say look i can make six stories work maybe eight stories but what happened there was the council of the day would say you no know, four stories was it um we went through a public process and the wisdom of public said four stories was it well that simply meant that you weren't going to get a lot built at that level now there have there have been some things built and you'll hear about them you know there's the uh, there's a recent very nice development actually that van dyke did in clarks that was limited to four or five stories right so it can happen but it can happen it happens when there's political will to support it and and a density and a reality check against the development pro forma all of these things have to come together there were so, no immediate 
because it's an effective as well. <laughs> I was going to say, and, and, and there's challenges certainly, but you know, the opportunities within there as well that you you, you can push and, and and try to find. But what we change a gear on a question here. We someone's you know looking at the the development of where Mississauga is now, and what they're asking is, you know, we kind of see where we're headed. But where are we in that process? The, the, the question is, uh, um, where are we in our city's evolution? How can we evolve away from surface parking cars and shopping centers? Yeah, so the big, the big component of that is the use of the car. And, uh, and so it's going to be, a, you know, well, I think here it'll be a slow process because we have built a city that where transit is not adequate to connect us in a timely way to our places of work. The GO, sta go stations have been effective. They gets us, that gets us to centers like downtown Toronto and elsewhere, other, other centers. But we don't have the local system, the network of transit and bike routes, the bike paths that are safe and connected. We're getting there on all of those fronts, but these things do take time. You can see the, uh, you can see the LRTs coming. It's another, another step in the connectivity. You can see the BRT lines coming, Lakeshore, um, uh, Dundas Street. So you can see the elements are coming, but the will to use them and the connectivity of them to places of employment are still not proven. So people are still going to get in their car and still expect that there's going to be parking at their destination. This is going to be a long process. Um, if, but, you know, the continued expansion of transit is going to help. The evolution of things like uh, Uber and alternative means of transportation are going to come into play as well, where you don't necessarily have to own a car. That means you don't necessarily have to build underground parking, very expensive component of any development now. You're, spent, you're talking between fifty dollars to $100,000 for a parking space in an underground garage. And when you're talking affordability, that's a very difficult extension. You know, you're going to build buy a small town, a small uh, unit in a condo might be $500,000. All of a sudden, it's going to be close to 600000 if you want to handle a car. Plus the car, you have to pay insurance and all of the costs that are related to that, and the gas pricing, all of these things mitigate against us um, achieving that, you know, maintaining that as a, uh, as a viable uh, way to go into the future. It just means everything's going to get more expensive. So these are slow conversions or behaviors. We started with an addiction to the car. We had to have it. You had to have a double car garage. You had to have two cars in the driveway. And even that wasn't enough sometimes. Yeah. So that's going to be a long process of adjustment, I think. Having said that, there are cities that did take very radical approaches to things like bike lanes and, 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 and arteries, car arteries. Denmark, Copenhagen, for example very dramatically changed the landscape. They closed streets. They created very, very positive bike paths. And that has spawned a bike culture that is second to none in the sense of using it as commuter routes, even in winter. Their winters are not that different than ours, um, especially now. We seem to have warmer winters. But um, uh, that's a whole other variable way, and a way to go that takes some degree of guts. Never a popular route because people still love their car and Mississauga is experiencing extreme traffic congestion. If you see it, I, I see it in the rush hours here. <coughs> so to get tell people that they're gonna have less cars, the war on the car is the issue, it'll be perceived as a very unpopular political move. And that's where it's gonna fail for a little while. A little while though, but I, we, have, we have two other questions here, but just as I read them, they're kind of twinned to each other and, and we've already touched on the nimbyism a little bit, but um, it, it comes, it speaks to the mindset um, and, and not only the, 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 the kind of the political will, but um, in your presentation, you've talked about the dichotomy between urban sprawl and the private backyard and in, in the, in the, in the, in the prospect of placemaking. And again, we talked about it with the NIMBYism and that idea of, you know, private property and the, and the like, but, you know, how can we transition our suburban mindset to embrace and celebrate concepts of developing values of common places? 
Um, you know, it's a big topic, but we have touched on it a little bit, but it, it, it talks to what you're just saying as well, but the car, right? It's, it's a mindset. It, it's, uh, how, how, how can we, how can we push that norm, I guess? Well, I think with the provision of more intense development, apartment form development, say, um, and even stock townhouse development, you, you don't have a large private outdoor area. You have a small balcony or a small terrace or a rooftop terrace, you have you have elements that don't equate to the backyard with the swimming pool and, and the trees and, and that kind of dreamy backyard that everybody wanted when they started. So what that means is people will begin to value their parks, public open space more. Um, I think we saw it in COVID, even we saw a lot of people using walking more. Now, I don't want to wish another COVID upon us, but um yeah, Knock on everything wood here <laughs> <laughs> yeah to yeah to, to encourage a difference in how we live but i think with intensification will come a realization that our open spaces um are are vital and valuable and you see that these are again lessons of european cities you see some exquisite major central open spaces and and enhanced boulevards and lovely kind of landscapes that you you do that just so that you can escape your little unit yeah you do it to get outside that's how you enjoy the outside it's more social it's more engaging it's not totally private limited with the backyard privacy fence and so it comes with intensification so i think part of that we will learn as we go and i think even today if you if you witness the waterfront parks in in poor credit and lakeview on a, a good summer, a warm summer day, you see people descending, uh, I suspect from other parts of the city, possibly from some co from condo developments. I think it'd be an interesting study to, to see where the people are coming from. Um, you can see they drive to the parks, so now there's limits on parking in the parkland. <laughs> yeah. Um, but they intensely use the parks. There's picnics going on, there's nonstop enjoyment. Uh, a lot of it appears to be new Canadians as well. It's an interesting observation. They seem to understand this idea of a common outdoor area as a place for enjoying life and partying. Um, and I'm, I'm, I was quite impressed to see how we, you know, how we are using these parks. And I think it's a result of an expectation. It's also a result of um, familiarity with that type of, uh, of socialization. Um, and it could be cultural, and it, it also is a recognition of, of I think, the, the nature of the units people live in. There's, yeah. If they're living in condominium life, you're going to have fewer options for that, uh, enjoying the, the sun and the, and the outdoor space. So that's where I think utilization would go up. So there's a number of interrelated components to that one, but so it's a little bit chicken and egg too, though, right? Like it's the intensification brings a change of mindset, I guess, in a way too. So it's uh... well, that's that's the challenge. These things, there's always a delay between you know, let's call it building condos, and it even happens with respect to mixed use. You know, yeah. often in development industry, what happens first is usually the subdivisions, and then at some point there's a population base, and that justifies a retail component. So. You get the little strip mall comes in 10 years after the subdivision goes in. It's a pattern that we've seen throughout Mississauga. Right. Next stage of that pattern is happening now. Those little malls, those little strip malls are now becoming development sites as Mississauga is running out of raw land. Right. Those are becoming the next uh, platform for intensified development. And that's an opportunity uh, to do some beautiful development that has incredible public space as well. So this combination of parks, open space, and development intensity is coming. Um, uh, and the only deterrent to that is the success of the retail environment. For example, Square One is remains to be a very successful retail uh, entity. And until it fails, it will never change. Right. But what's growing up around it is a whole other urban environment. Um, and that's with, the, that's uh, we see our city center evolving leaps and bounds over the last few years. Like we're we're seeing that density come and 
and the, the change of landscape. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I, I had to compliment you on, but uh, and for anyone who hasn't had a chance to watch the, the webinar uh, that, that you did, we'll have the link here, but just, you know, there is a positive tone to this. It is, a development isn't always a negative thing. If you, you know, a, a properly steered and responsible development brings opportunities and brings, you know, it can, I can help bring the there there. And I, and I want to compliment you on just that positive note uh, of, of well, the opportunity yeah. that's in front of us. It has to be a win-win situation. That unfortunately, we were now we're we're more caught. Everything's combative now, and that's where the NIMBY against the developer. Those are the extremes, right? But there's a new there's a new term called YIMBY. Yes, in my backyard, which generally speaks to that balance of uh, you know what's in it for us, Mr. Developer <laughs> or Mrs. Developer. Sorry, I don't want to be sexist. No, there's always that opportunity. So in the realm of creating the there there um, and the opportunities that it presents and the, the challenges that we've talked about with NIMBYism and just mindset in general, there's also an opportunity, or I perceive it as an opportunity, that the role that built heritage can play from a, a preservation perspective, a celebration perspective. Can you touch on just, I know you have an incredible amount of experience in this world, but just the role that 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 physical heritage, the protection of buildings can play in the development of there, there on our landscape. Yeah, this is a rich topic because, you know, I think, um, you know, heritage assets, heritage attributes can, can really be the elements that tell a story of our history. It's a recent history, but it's an important one. Um, and, and, it'll, and it comes in different levels too. I mean, we also have indigenous history that needs to be celebrated. So, there's locational realities attached to the indigenous history, trails, use of the river. These are all elements um, uh, of, of our history that I think need, that, that could be those elements that celebrate and give a, a sense of our, our history and soul uh, on a daily basis. So I think those are, you know, for each era of development, I think there are methods to deal with uh, celebration of those elements. Um, now, the with respect to physical built built form, I think those are, you know, many cities are, are, are have very rich uh, heritage districts that are intact and stay. We have a few of them. Um, Port Credit has one. Me Meadowvale certainly is another. Streetsville. These these are elements that I think do by by being rather relatively consistent and, and protective of their their heritage assets um, the story is preserved and it's preserved in a living situation like a main street in streetsville like lakeshore road and, and port credit to a degree but more red meadowvale's more uh you know it's more intact in the sense of its original character is still there yeah despite some like new new developments coming but very much heritage offers this way to make a place memorable um when it's retained, it tells stories. It tells stories. My office, for example, tells stories about, um, you know, the stone hookers. That was how they, but even more than that, it showed the evolution of a family that arrived here with basically nothing, um, decided to get a boat. And with that boat, they could do stone hooking. When stone hooking dried up, they could do rum running <laughs> and fishing to be fair. <laughs> fishing was also a, it's all about opportunity then and now. <laughs> it's, opportunity, it's opportunity and it's, it's, a, it's a very constant theme and, and one that, that, you know, I think we should, we should be celebrating. Um, so these, these are important ways to, I think, uh, you know, tell our stories. Um, so that's the beauty of the, the, the heritage. Now, Mississauga is not known for a rich collection of heritage buildings. Like you see in parts of bigger cities, older cities, Chicago, Toronto, New York, you, you'll have those elements that are clear landmarks from a heritage perspective. We have fewer of those, but we have them. And that makes it even harder for us to preserve sometimes because, you know, the argument is, well, it's it's just one building and it's not that old and, you know, it's kind of the ants have taken over or whatever. <laughs> There's, you know, developers have, uh, developers have developed this very let's call it strong um, uh, aversion to preserving heritage because they see it as a limitation to the easy ease of their development. I wish they would recognize it as a way to promote their development. I mean, that to me is the alternative here. You make it a theme that 
it shows leadership and shows, um, you know, tells a story about the community. So I think there's got to be a, I think that's our role in heritage is to really make these opportunities available and try to convey to the development industry that these are important uh, components. Um, I had a, a very limited role on the old barber house. I mean, it was interesting in my career, I was able to do a, both in addition to the barber house over 30 years ago, I think, and then to see it demolished. And, but the home, the original uh, old barber house is preserved in a new development that deals yep. with townhouses and whatnot. So, you know, I was, that was an important uh, moment where I was brought in, and thankfully through the council, I was brought in to say, look, if you celebrate this heritage asset in a way that's more prominent, make it a feature of your, of your development, um, you'll enhance the character of both the, the, the neighborhood generally, but also of your, your marketing campaign. People yeah. will want to be living next to a landmark like that. Great example of how a developer could embrace that and did embrace that. Yep. You know, eventually needed a little bit of strong arming to get there, but <laughs> yeah. In, 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 a, in a future episode of Ask a Story, and actually we will be exploring the story of the Barber House uh, down the road. So towards the end of October, early November, we'll have an episode uh, looking at the Barber House story. Um, but I mean, it, you're, you, I, I think you're, 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 you're so right on the, you know, heritage can, can play a role. So, you know, we, we deal about, you know, we've, we've talked about NIMBYism and the, and the mentality, the suburban mentality that is, is often a, against this, this new development phase. But there's also a mentality and a, a mindset within the development community as well and you know perhaps the marrying of the two involves you know the the, the preservation of heritage landmarks and, and and they find a common ground therein well i think it, i think it is i think we're also seeing this now in another project we've had involvement with it is on high street and ann street in mississauga two yep. wonderful heritage designated homes are being preserved in situ where they are today with their trees intact around them um, and that was the developer leading it. One of our, one of our board members as well, Frank Giannone, is to his credit, recognized that this is an important way to preserve that story, you know, important story of the history of Port Credit, the starch plant, all of that is memorialized by keeping these two homes. These are managers' homes related to that. And they're beautifully beautiful buildings that are well articulated, well designed. Yep. So they tell the story and they're integrated with this rather intensive development, you know, 22 stories next door with a public park, but it has the elements that I'm talking about, the heritage component, uh, pres preservation the correct way, a uh, public park, and here's where the city bent a bit. They, you know, they took the lawn bowling park and they altered the configuration of it in a certain way to make it work for the developer's interest, which had to do with physical constraints of parking, layout. You know, these are realities of building ways to do efficiency building and so all of those elements came together and I think I think it's a great example of how you can marry new development um, with heritage preservation and storytelling that, that you know tells tells aspects of relevant stories to that location. So, so, in a, so in a very subtle way, with the the storytelling, and you combine kind of the the the, the heritage preservation, but you're integrating new things on the landscape, like rapid transit and uh, high density uh, intensification and things like that. You you kind of push the needle a bit in terms of uh, of just you know how people interact with their landscape, and and kind of you 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 set the yeah. course. I guess that's the official plan. You set the course of where you want to get, and uh, you start implementing these things. That will will eventually take you there, but it takes time. It does, and it, and it takes it takes some well, certainly time and, and the right will. Yeah. You know, what we're seeing, I'm involved in another project in Toronto, which is a hotel project, hotel mixed hotel and condo, on a strip of King Street East, which was a very lovely preserved streetscape of heritage buildings, uh, built in the mid eight, 1900 mid 1800s, 19th century, and what we're seeing now is a, a much closer integration of, uh, on very tight sites, the integration of uh, heritage buildings. Some people call this facadism because you're only preserving elements of it. But yeah. what we're seeing is that there's a way to preserve that's beyond, has more depth than facadism. You're, you're going to, you know, keep a good 10 or 11 meters of that 
facade so that it has more robust three-dimensional characteristic but i'm seeing some pretty exciting preservation ideas happening in toronto where the character from the street perspective is there the heritage of memory the character is there but there's a tall building that's poking out above it yeah um, this is going to become a, a new kind of method to preserve at least the elements of heritage where you can't preserve the full in situ built form the way it was. I think another example of this is the, uh, the post office. I was going to say the post office, yes. Post office, they chose to save um, the facades through uh, holding them up by structural means. And this is a common way to do it. But we've seen recently some other uh, very successful ones. The Loblaws, original Loblaws warehouse down at Bathurst Street and, and Front Street has been rebuilt. And what they did was they removed every bit of the building. They demolished it, but they kept every brick, numbered it. Every piece of precast was lettered and numbered so that it kept in a, in a warehouse for four or five years before it was then re-erected on a new structure on the site. <laughs> now, if you drive by the site today, you would not know that that was done. You would say the building was preserved, but uh, we didn't, not sure how. <laughs> <laughs> There's another example on St. Thomas Street uh, downtown, the, the Windsor Arms Hotel. You walk into that hotel, quaint little hotel, 17-story building popping out at the top of it, and you realize that, or you, you may not realize, but every one of those bricks and pieces of precast were removed, stored, labeled, and re-erected on a concrete structure that was the new condo. So what it's done, though, I mean, it's never seen as the best first option for preservation, but it is emerging as a, a reasonable second choice where you're preserving the character of the, the history of the site, but you're doing it in a way that's both more economical from a new build perspective and it recognizes the density and the heights that you need to build to. Yeah. But it preserves a pedestrian experience of the streetscape, the public realm is preserved as having that story in your face and telling the story. So it's a new and emerging way. It's being more tolerated in the, the heritage community as a way to go, because it balances that need to make efficient building. Um, we have to make our condo buildings also resilient in the sense of uh, long-term future performance. Yeah. You know, yeah. The skin, the waterproofing. And when you start to marry it to a heritage building, you get into complications like this. So. Um, anyway, there's a number of complex situations here, but I think there's a number of methods to use to preserve heritage through intensification that provides this balancing act of uh, development reality, development uh, resiliency, all of that. Yep. Um, new environmental sustainability, things can be built into new build form um, and still preserve an element of the heritage piece that tells the story of our history. Okay. And I, and I guess, I mean, that's the, the biggest challenge is that balancing act of, you know, you know, competing mindsets or competing perspectives of, I, I, you know, I always say that to start on the, the premise when we're talking about intensification and development, that development is coming. The demand is there. The changes are coming on our landscape. Like, it's nice to have a, you know, a, a hand in the process of, of what that development might be or, you know, make sure that there's a good hand steering the project from the city perspective of what's expected on a development. But, but finding that common ground not only between heritage preservation but also between just the the public realm of of those that look back backward with you know a bit of romance on what was and and those that perhaps are steering the course forward and trying to find that connection that can 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 i guess inhabit both worlds uh, and uh, and make it work for those that were here and those that are coming well, exactly. The continuity of time is, is an important element of any development. The, the new build that you make today, and that's why I focus on heritage as having a future perspective. We're building the heritage of the future. So in 50 years or 60 years, and you can see it, it's happening a bit with mid, mid-century modern buildings now. They're being preserved in a certain in a way that they never were before. Right. They were seen as, you know, just old and decrepit and ceilings were too low and the insulation was not adequate, and so we're going to tear it down. Well, now there's, there's great blowback on, on that, where there's an idea about preservation of that, and that's a more controversial topic because the heritage isn't perceived so much as heritage in a desirable way. It's perceived as, oh, that's a low point of 
go for <laughs> bad insulation, you know, leaky windows, single yep. pane. All of those things can be fixed uh, even in a, in a rebuild, but these are challenges that that, that will emerge with uh, with the future perspective. But we have that continuity from the past to the future, and, and we've got to dig a little further back. There should be an indigenous story on every one of these buildings. Yes, sites. absolutely. Um, and that's starting to happen, but it needs to happen, I think, in a more tangible way, in a more just a ready, readily available way. These are stories that are that are, are very important to the community. And I think as we see the, the rise of indigenous populations and their presence in the community, I, I think this is gonna become an important theme in everything we do. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, with that, Michael, I, I just thank you for spending some time with us and, and sharing your expertise, your passion, your, your, your knowledge of what is, uh, what is transpiring before us. It's always, to me, I'm, I'm, I'm I marvel at looking at the city through your eyes because it, you do. You're one of the ones who does embrace that that then and now type of, type of perspective, and I love the positivity you put on it. So thank you so much for spending time with us here. You're welcome, but I must say not everyone shares that. Enthusiasm. I know, I know. <laughs> we, we still struggle for that balance as well, uh, but. Uh, uh, with that, thank you to everyone for joining us here on Ask a Story. And if you haven't checked out Michael's uh, webinar with uh, Heritage Mississauga's Placemaking Series, I do encourage you to do so. Um, and for those that sent in your questions, thank you so much. Uh, like, subscribe, and follow us here at Heritage Mississauga. And we will see you next week with another episode of Ask a Historian. Thank you.